there's a passage passage that I'd like everyone here to remember forever it's Matthew 16 verse 28 you may never have really noticed it before it bears a vital import to everything we do it's the master speaking and he makes this statement verily I say unto you there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom I'd like to repeat that verily I say unto you there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom now that's Matthew 16 verse 28 and the meaning of it is electrifying and bears a close relationship with today's chapter 13 in John if you were to hear this and were to include yourself it would be telling you that you cannot die until you have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom now the kingdom of God is within you the Son of Man is Christ and if you have been chosen then you cannot die until Christ enters the kingdom of God in other words you have been chosen to receive Christ consciousness and it is impossible to die until Christ consciousness comes to you and of course the meaning further mean further indicates that when Christ consciousness has come to you has come to you and you die you're not dying because Christ is life and so he is saying here that all who are disciples of Christ who are truly opening their hearts to the Christ of their own being who are not here for the loaves and the fishes who are not stopping at the letter of truth who are not seeking things of this world but who are seeking God for God's sake alone who have chosen the Christ as their goal in realization who know that through Christ they are one with the Father eternally that these are the chosen and that it is impossible for them to die until they have received Christ until the Son of Man is in his kingdom and then when they die it is a different kind of death than a human death it is a transition to a higher level to the realm of soul to the fifth world now this is his statement to all who follow seek and accept the Christ identity you cannot die if you seek Christ within you until you receive Christ that's the importance of this and the importance further takes another turn when we consider the 13th chapter of John which I think we could give the title for the moment not all of it but the portion we're to discuss today let's call it washing the mystical body because after having given us a complete course in what the Christ can do on this earth the Christ does not stop there and say see what I have done he says do likewise follow me the path that I have outlined is the path for every man the kingdom that I have hinted at 
by revealing the invisible harmonies of God wherever man has seen discord. This kingdom is at hand now. What are you waiting for? You can't walk in it as a mortal being. You've learnt about Christ, now be Christ. And so he takes us quietly into a deeper level of the teaching. There is a supper. And it's just a few days before Passover. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his home, that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. He loved them unto the end. Does it mean the end of the life of Jesus Christ on earth? Or does it mean what was said later? I can never leave thee, even unto the end of the world. He loved them unto the end. The Christ, being omniscient, could see the fullness of of that which is and the love of the Christ extends through to the end of this world through to the end of mortality in other words having been touched by the love of the Christ and you know when this happens you can be certain that the love of the Christ which has touched you, which you have received, which you have realized as ever present, this is a forever love unto the end. It can never depart. And so when you have reached that level of assurance that you have in some way experienced the love of Christ, you may rest confidently that wherever you go, whatever you do, whether you live in what the world calls sin or not, the love of the Christ is forever. It is your permanent heritage. It can never be removed. There is no power on the earth that can remove the love of the Christ until the end. And that end is only when you have made your transition into being Christ. That end is the beginning of Christhood and the end of mortality. This is the assurance that Christ never departs your being, but is your being. Now those of us who have doubted who have felt perhaps that we had been forsaken. It is actually we who had forsaken the Christ. We, in experiencing the things of this world, the pains and the pleasures, the dualities, the complaints, the resentments, the fears, the hates, the discords, all we are doing is denying that we are that Christ. Every pain says, I am not Christ. Every fear says, I am not Christ. Every form of hostility toward another says, He is not Christ, nor am I. For Christ is none of these things. And so carefully we watch our actions to be sure that we are serving the inner Christ by recognition, by acceptance, by love, by humility, by all those things that are Christ-like. And every time we act out of character, we invite the karma of the world. The love of the Christ being ever with us when we are in another form of emotion than divine love, when we are in hate, animosity, we are turning from that love which is ever present, ever ready to forgive, to erase, to look through the physical activity into the spiritual harmony ever present. This is our dispensation 
which we have been ignorant of as human beings. But now as we come closer to the Passover, the transition, the real Passover, we are being made aware of the ever-presence of divine love, felt only by those who have opened themselves to the acceptance of it. Supper being ended, the devil now having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God, he rises from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Now, it may not have been too long ago that we discussed this passage, and we all know that he was recognizing the inner Christ of Peter and the other disciples by washing their feet. He was saying, Abba, Father. But that isn't the whole picture. In your exercise, as you took the world in through each sense, as you recognize that the outer is really the inner level of your consciousness externalized, as you may have come to the conclusion that the entire human world is mental, it never gets outside of our thought, and our thought never gets outside of our mind. As you reach this level, knowing that all this world is within your mind, you are partly in control of the dream called the world. And if you learn the way of releasing your thought and receiving divine thought, then through what may be called transmutation of thought, the thought in you being divined instead of human, it will externalize as your world instead of mortal thought. And you will begin to outpicture divine harmonies. And so that is the meaning of earth being transformed into heaven. The meek shall inherit the earth. Those who are meek unto the divine word, the divine thought, are able to be a channel through which earth is transformed into heaven by the process of externalization of divine thought. But this, of course, brings us to the need for not the mind of man, but the mind of Christ. For the mind of Christ does precisely that. Divine thought moving through the mind of Christ externalizes as the kingdom of heaven on earth. But if he be perfect as your father, if ye be the Christ of God, if ye be the child of God, then you must have the mind of the Christ. It isn't a question of acquiring it. It must be yours now, as a fact. And therefore, the mind of Christ, which is yours now, is what you are denying when you're in mortal or human thought. You're in that mind, which is not the mind of Christ. <clears throat> and therefore it becomes necessary <coughs> to sup at the table with Christ now this supper is a spiritual supping where they are learning spiritual truth We have all learned much of the letter of truth, but abruptly the Master rises. He rises from the supper, and we must rise from the supper too. We have been learning the letter, but you must be reborn of the water 
and the spirit. The letter is not sufficient. And so though you sup at the table, though you learn the letter of truth, you must rise from the supping and you must go forth and do. The outer acts of the man must conform with the inner teaching. It is not enough to know. The inner must be the master of the outer and the outer must obey the inner and go forth and rise from the letter to the activity of the spirit made visible. In Luke we are told that there was dissension among the disciples. Each had his own ideas about where he would be in the new kingdom. The right and the left. What position he would occupy. How the world would look at him and admire him for being one of the chosen. And this was a perfect moment for the master to rise and show them something completely different. This promise made in Matthew that some were there who would not die until the Son of Man had entered into its kingdom. This could not be fulfilled by those who were concerned about who would sit on the right or the left or who would be secretary and who would be treasurer, who would be a deacon and who wouldn't be. They had to know about deeper things. He had to rise from the letter and take them now into the washing of the mystical body. You, when there's dirt on your arm or your body, you wash it off. So it is with the mystical body. And the thing you have to wash off of your mystical body is your mortal body. That is the darkness that overshadows the mystical body. Just as we wash dirt from the arm, we must wash mortality off so that the mystical body can shine through. And that is not an outer baptism, it is an inner baptism. It is the second baptism. It is the baptism of the Christ. And until we go through the baptism of the Christ, we are not washing away the dross of mortality so that the mystical body can shine forth. And now every act has a meaning. Very carefully he's going to show precisely what each one must go through. But first there's an important statement here. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Before he rose from the supper, that statement is made. He knew all things were given into his hands. Jesus being the Christ, we shall say then that all things were given to the Christ. But what does that precisely mean for us? Let's go back now. Let's go back to the prophecy made at the time of his birth. You'll find it in Luke 1, 28 to 35, where the angel appears to Mary and tells us about the power that will be given unto Jesus. Luke 1, 28. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. A few more verses. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now this is speaking of Christ. And this is the Christ who stands up, rising from the supper, who knows that all things are given unto him. 
This then is the Christ of God appearing on earth, teaching disciples ostensibly, but actually teaching everyone everywhere throughout time who is a disciple of the inner Christ. All things were given unto him. Now let's clarify that. We've seen that the prophecy was made at the time of the Immaculate Conception that Christ would be omnipotent on the earth. That was really a statement that Christ is omnipotent on the earth. That is the statement that Christ in you is omnipotent now. That Christ everywhere is Christ in you. And that only the omnipotence of Christ is on this earth. And all that is not, that omnipotence is not power whatsoever, but illusion of power. That all so-called power in sin and disease, evil and death, error and destruction is illusion of power. For Christ is power and Christ is love and therefore that which we give power to in whatever is not love is our denial of the Christ omnipotence, the Christ identity, the Christ everywhere being the power of love. Our denial doesn't change the fact. Our denial merely separates us from the experience of that which we are denying. All power was given unto him. This is the omnipotent Christ. And Christ is your name. And so the mystical body is going to depend upon your accepting, your accepting the omnipotent Christ as identity in order for you to experience the mystical body. Christ is going to demonstrate in the outer, in the visible, a pantomime which will tell you about your mystical body. And this is the Christ who is omnipotent so that if you were to understand if you were to accept, if you were to follow, if you were to live as directed, if you have both the capacity and the will and the desire to live as directed by the Christ, then the omnipotence of Christ becomes to you a living experience of your being. And you walk in a mystical body in the kingdom of God on earth. That is why those who receive the omnipotent Christ in themselves as their reality cannot die because Christ is life. And if you have set your goal upon the receiving of the mystical Christ as your being, that alone is sufficient for you not to die until the Christ arrives in your consciousness. And so in this particular chapter we're moving out of the letter crossing the threshold of words. We're moving into the inner self that realm which when it is attained becomes the activity of the outer self and we are made whole in Christ. I think it's worth our time to carefully delineate other passages in the Bible speaking of the omnipotence of Christ. One of them is the prophecy of Daniel. This was before the angel Gabriel came to Mary. You'll find that in the seventh chapter of Daniel, in the thirteenth verse. You must remember that the prophecy made through Daniel although uttered through his lips, was made by the very Christ about itself. That is why a prophet can prophesy spiritually. It is Christ in the prophet who makes the prophecy. And then it is Christ in Mary, appearing as Gabriel, who makes the same prophecy about the appearance of Jesus. Daniel 7.13 
I saw in the night visions. I saw, remember that, I saw in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man came, the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, his dominion in an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The kingdom of Christ is being spoken of. A kingdom that shall not pass away. A kingdom of dominion and glory. That is the kingdom of Christ in you. This is to accentuate the need to turn to the Christ of your being out of the mortal sense of self. First from Daniel, a prophecy, from many others incidentally, then Gabriel to Mary, and then finally Jesus the Christ makes his own statements about it. We find in Matthew 28, the 18th verse, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Christ, Jesus says, Christ in you says, this is the important point, Christ in every one of us says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We know where to go for this power. In Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. To the Son in you, Christ, the Father delivers all things. There's no mistaking its intention. It's to teach us that Christ in us receives all things of the Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. If you wish to know God, you can only know God as Christ, not as a mortal being. God does not know you as a mortal being. God knows the Christ. And the Christ knows God. And no matter how we profess love of God, until we are living, being, Christ itself. We do not know God. We have not risen from the supper. We are still talking words. And so it's very clear that to know God aright, you must accept the divinity of Christ within yourself here and now. And we're going to learn some beautiful ways to live as the Christ to open up the heart and the soul. Some ways I'm happy to note that many of you are already practicing very diligently. In Revelation, we find a glorious statement for all of us. The 17th chapter... It's about the omnipotence of Christ in you. This is the 17th chapter and the 14th verse. These shall make war with the Lamb. And they're speaking of the beast and the beast's delegates. They're referring to all of this as the ten horns. These shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb is Christ in you. The beast is the world mind. The delegates are the mind of man and the body, the material world, which is the creation of world mind, and the mind of man, which is the creation of world mind. These constitute the beast and the delegates, world mind, individual human mind, and matter, form, body. These shall make war with the Lamb, the Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord. Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him 
are called and chosen and faithful. Clearly again, only in Christ's identity are we a match for the world mind, the powers of the world, the might of the world, the dualities of the world. The Lamb in you, the Christ, yourself living, overcomes all dualities in the world. Now let's look at some in John because we're accentuating here that until Christ is identity, realized, accepted, lived in, experienced, we're just targets for the world mind and we're not living in God. Chapter 3, John, 331, 35, and 36. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. The Father loveth the Son, and hath giveth all things unto his hand. Why is the statement here that the Father has given all things unto the Son? Because if you want things of the Father, you must be the Son. And when you say, I am, you must know what you're saying. When a mortal says, I am the Son of God, he's not speaking the truth. God made no person. There is no person who is the Son of God. Christ is the Son of God. When you say, I am, you're saying, I am not person. I am not flesh and blood. I am not physical form. I am not human being. I am not a temporary lifespan. When you say I am, you're saying I am the living spirit and substance that God is. For the qualities of the Father only function in the spirit of the Father. The Father gives all things to the Son. The substance of the Father is the substance of the Son and is not corporeal, is not flesh and blood is not physical form and therefore I am means I am not physical form I am not human self I am not person I am that child of God which is the living spirit called the Christ that transition in consciousness makes possible the transition out of form into spiritual selfhood into the mystical body how can there be a transition into the mystical body without a transition in consciousness? He that believeth on the Son, whoever knows himself to be that Christ, hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth in him. We repeat these things because there should be a clear cut direction for all of us to be living in Christ as Christ I think we can all agree to that the question then becomes how there are more passages that must be looked at in John 5.22 The Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now then, that clearly states that you are either in Christ or not. And so you make your own judgment about yourself. If you're not in Christ, you cannot expect all that the Father has to give to the Son to flow into your experience. If you're in Christ, all that the Father hath is thine. And so the judgment is in Christ, in the Son. The Son completely expresses the Father. And if you're not in the Son, you do not express the Father. <coughs> Going just a bit beyond where we are in John, let's look at 1714. 
chapter 17, verse 2. This is right close to crucifixion. In his prayer, the Master says, speaking of the Christ, the Son, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Christ in you has power over all flesh and gives eternal life to as many as are given him. When you turn to Christ in you, the omnipotence of Christ in you has power over all flesh and can and does assure eternal life. The further the dominion is explained in Corinthians as he has put all things under his feet. In Peter's letters it is called he is sitting at the right hand of God. In Ephesians it is said that in the fullness of the time all things are gathered unto Christ. These are all expressions of different levels in which For you, when it is the fullness of the time, all things must be gathered into Christ, who sits on the right hand of God, meaning the omnipotence of God is in Christ. He has gathered all things unto him. The earth is his footstool. You're learning that Christ in you has no opposition. And there's a passage in Ephesians that tells you that Christ in you has no opposition on land, on sea, and in the air. That dominion is over heaven and earth. All this about the you that mortal mind turns away from. And in Hebrews, we have a very beautiful one again. This is the first verse, first chapter of Hebrews, and the very second and third verse, in which we learn that only Christ in you is the divine image and likeness of God. We have been looking for the divine image and likeness of God, thinking it was mortal man in some way, and yet here we are. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and the upholding all things by the word of his power, sat down on the right hand of the majesty, his majesty on high. Christ in you is the image and likeness of God. The image and likeness of God is sustained forever. All right? Now let's look back here at John. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, rises from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. Let's take that phrase, laying aside his garments. You may know by now that Christ Jesus was replaying for us that which he had already completely experienced. That he was an immaculately conceived individual by virtue of the fact that he had already made transition before birth. And you have heard from Joel that when you have made transition you have a choice of returning into form, the appearance of form, on a mission. In other words, you return not to expiate karma, as everyone usually does, but you return because as a transcendent individual, you have a mission to perform on the earth. So you come back not because karma compels you to, you come back voluntarily. Now that would be called laying down your garments. You see, you lay down your heavenly garments, having transcended 
You live in the spiritual universe in spiritual garments, heavenly garments. And volunteering to return to the appearance call form, you would lay down those garments and come back and you would take a towel. You would trade in your heavenly garments for the garments on earth. Now Jesus in this very simple statement through pantomime is telling us that he has already transcended in a previous lifespan. He has returned voluntarily. He has laid down his heavenly garments. And that Christ through him is expressing a teaching about how we can make the same transition that he accomplished before the Immaculate Conception through Mary. Now, we are going to lay down our garments in a different way because it's going to take a bit of time before we can come to that place where we are in the world after transition. We lay down our garments we lay down certain attitudes. We lay down that garment of mortality. We lay, lay down the arrogance of humanhood. We lay down the desire to be somebody of importance. We lay down all that detracts from the free expression of Christ. We take up a towel This is symbolic of being willing to serve And we serve the Christ within ourselves We follow the master who has volunteered to return To instruct, to guide, to lead And we do the same with our brethren we are willing to lead, to guide, to teach, to love, to serve in the highest position or the lowest, whichever is directed, to perform the most menial tasks if required. That is the towel. <coughs> and the reason is that we are learning to step outside of our personal sense of self. We must break that outer crust which says this is a me. And we must see that there is no me present whatsoever. Christ is present. And that localized within this crust called me. Christ is there and there. We begin to expand the expression of Christ. We rise from the supper. We live out the awareness of Christ in every one. Instead of looking out with the eyes that see the world of persons, on faith we look out with the inner eye that sees the one invisible Christ in all, and this is taking up the towel. This is beginning to establish the need for a sense of love that the person is not capable of. A sense of love that transcends our normal attitudes. This is a sense of love which emanates from the knowledge that Christ is love and I cannot be outside of love. Nor can I be ignorant of love or immune to love or opaque to love. I must express love for that is the nature of Christ. And until I express love, I am denying my own Christhood. Until I express love, I am not accepting the universal nature of Christ everywhere. You'll find from this point on, more and more of the gospel turns to love. Because this is how you accept Christ. This is how you express Christ. This is how you renounce mortality. You'll find love and humility play a higher and higher part 
out in all that you're required to do and this is how you wash the mystical body washing is a purification and as he bends down to wash the feet he pours water in a basin this is new water this is Christ water this is living water living water flows from the Christ of your own being and the basin which symbolizes the human sense mind is refilled with this new water the old thought the human thought in that basin is emptied out divine thought the thought of Christ is flowing into that basin so you're receiving divine thought you're accepting Christ within and listening to Christ within and it flows into your consciousness your consciousness becomes the basin which receives the flowing living waters of the Christ which you have accepted within yourself and this is a purification this is a removal of that which is not and as the grossness the density of human concepts is slowly dissolved you are doing for your mystical body precisely what you do when you wash your physical body you are washing away that which was not so that the light can shine through where darkness had made it unavailable to our experience and now he stoops he comes to Peter after he poureth water into a basin began to wash the disciples feet and to wash them with a towel wherewith he was girded then cometh he to Simon Peter and Peter saith unto him Lord dost thou wash my feet now you know all about Peter because there's a Peter who plays a part of everyone's consciousness great physical courage great faith but also very dark with human desire wants to be out front wants to be seen by the eyes of men wants to miss nothing get into everything a very ardent need to be idolized Peter has no awareness of the inner Christ there's a phase of us which although it's eager to know God and to love God it hasn't yet been trained to recognize the inner Christ and so all of our enthusiasm and dedication often gets no further than the level of words because Peter was unaware of his mystical body what you're going to wash my feet unheard of why would the president wash the feet of the vice president why would the master wash the feet of a disciple But who is Jesus Christ? Except God teaching directly through this form what each of us must learn. That we must serve the Christ. Serve the inner master of our own being. Isn't this the same Christ in the outer who is going to say, if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you? isn't that outer Christ then also the inner Christ of Peter isn't it really the inner Christ who is saying to Peter turn to me wash my feet as I in the outer am washing your feet the inner comes to the outer washes the feet of Peter and is saying to Peter now do the same turn within and wash my feet give me the drink wash my feet 
serve the Christ within yourself as I in the outer am now serving you. What an incredible teaching that the master within and without could teach from both directions. And all disciples went through the same experience because he had come down the line till he came to Peter. It was Peter who wanted to be so important, who out of his sense of what he called devotion, said, oh no, you can't do that to me. He is the one who didn't understand. Human pride, a human false sense of love of Jesus, and just today, we see it all over. They love Jesus. They would probably have said to Jesus, just as Peter did, Oh, you cannot wash my feet. I'll wash yours. I'm quite sure that would be the case in thousands of the Jesus lovers today. It was with Peter, and his love was sincere. So the mystical body is revealed. When the Master says to Peter, What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You're going to learn about this, and very soon, Peter, you'll understand what I'm doing. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, What if I wash thee not? Thou hast no part with me. Until you serve the Christ within, you cannot come into the second baptism. The second baptism is the baptism of Christ. The first baptism is in the external, symbolized by water, but actually the receiving of the water of truth. Unless you receive the inner baptism of the Christ, you have no part of the Spirit of God. This inner baptism, this second baptism, is the purpose of the washing of the feet. Well, if it's that great, says Peter, how about my head? And how about my, what else do you want wash here? My hand. Not only my feet, my hands, my head. Oh, that's a beautiful statement because you know what it's talking about. It's talking about every church ritual. All of the outer external movement, all of the things done in some kind of superstitious symbology, but none of it having anything to do with the truth of the inner Christ body released as an experience. Peter, you see, they said he wanted to miss anything. If it was good for the feet, it was certainly good for the hands and the head. Again comes the Master and says, He that is washed, you just not say to wash his feet. But it's clean every whip. And ye are clean, meaning his disciples, but not all. Not all of you are clean. Now why is it that if the feet are washed, there's no more washing necessary? It's kind of like if you're buying a bolt of some kind of cloth, you get a sample. And if the sample is what you want, you know that the rest of the boat is going to be that way. The washing of the feet is only a sample. The moment you have washed the foot, you have washed away the concept of physical form, the whole boat. You could have gone out and said, wash the heart, wash the liver, wash the five senses, wash the elbow, wash all the rings of your physical body. But the foot is the contact with us. When you stand on the earth, that foot makes contact, and that is the mortal sense which says, I am walking on the earth. 
There's nobody walking on the earth but Christ. And Christ is walking in what we call earth, which is heaven. And so the washing of the foot is the revelation of many, many, many things. It's revealing that in your true self, here and now, you are in corporeal being. You don't even have a foot. Peter, he might have said, I want you to stop being a person. God didn't make any. Peter, I want you to stop being a physical human being. God didn't make any. Peter, I want you to resurrect right now. Remember, Peter, that I said that whoever receives the Christ will live forever. And Peter, you know this physical form doesn't live forever. Your living forever is in Christ's work. And after you've lost the form, Peter, if you haven't found Christ by then, you're going to just have to come back and do it all over again. And so now, Peter, resurrect, wash the foot, wash away the concept of a physical Peter because there really isn't any. How can you be Christ and Peter too? How could I be Christ and Jesus too? How could you be Christ and John too? You are Christ. You can call yourself Christ John, Christ Peter, Christ Jesus, but Christ is your name. And you might say John or Peter or Jesus is your individuality. But your life is Christ, your substance is Christ, your self is Christ. Your oneness with God must be in Christ. Wash away the foot, Peter. Wash them both away. And then work up until there's nothing left but the mystical body. And this is the washing of the mystical body, the slow realization that to be the Christ body, I must not accept another body. And to be the Christ body, I must not accept another mind. Only in the Christ mind will I know myself as the Christ body. Now there's something I've discovered for myself that helps me tremendously. I hope you can be helped, uh, find some help from it. 